Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A happy Father's Day to you all. So many, uh, many blessings on this day in which we obviously honor and glorify the Lord, but also give him thanks and rejoice for the fathers that he has given us. Um, so please do um, know that we have our prayers and blessings there for, for our fathers, and we can rejoice together. Um, I'm not sure if Glenn will bring that out explicitly in his sermon. I don't know, right? We, we wait to see. Nonetheless, um, we're grateful that we can... Well, you know, yeah, that's right. It need not be, but I'm just curious. We'll to, um, I'm not trying to set you up, Glenn, there, right, in, in, in any way. But I realized I just kind of did, right? So, oh, well, what, that's all right. You know? um, in any event, well, happy Father's Day uh, to all you families and fathers. Well, for our Lord's Day today, we will have uh, our coffee connection immediately following our service, in which we will observe the Lord's Supper. That was a little unexpected, but thankfully we were able to be here with you this morning. So we will celebrate the supper uh, following Glenn's administration of the Word. We'll move to the visible Word, and then we will have our coffee connection, and then we'll have Sunday school. So we begin this summer of Psalms, right? We begin it on this Sunday. Chris is leading us today, Psalm 104, right? And... um, but no, that's right. You have to say something about Father's Day too. No, um, just kidding, Chris. The uh, we can, um, if we like, we can move on over to the porch even, you know, and enjoy the the weather. And I know that yesterday we had a very successful work day. Thank you for everybody who was able to come out and to do that. So there's, I think, a lot of yard work has been done. So that will beautify that opportunity, even as we come to the beautiful word of the Lord, as Chris will lead us. So why don't we plan for that? We'll have. Our coffee connection, then we can take our drinks and other things, and we can move over to the uh, the gardens and enjoy, particularly the hydrangea area where it's shaded and should be good weather. Now, if a thunderstorm moves in or bugs or whatever, we we do have some space to return, but we'll plan for that, and that will be all of our families together, all of our families together, although I will take joy and Liam and Gabe, and we'll go and have some more conversation on the uh, the Lord's Supper. So that'll be good. All right, uh, Wednesday, we'll have our prayer meeting. Oh, before I forget, this evening, we have our Sunday evening fellowship, and we will have it at 5 p.m., and we will have it at the church this evening. We'll have it at the church. Now, we are having food, I believe. Um, I want to say Joy, she might be helping out in the narthex, but um, I believe we are having food um, that is at 5 p.m., so we can go and also use the grounds at that time. We'll have opportunity to worship together and do, uh, to enjoy uh, a small meal together as well as we continue to celebrate this Lord's Day on Father's Day. So that's tonight at the church at 5 p.m. On Wednesday, we'll have our prayer meeting, and then since next Sunday is our fourth Sunday, we will have the Lord's Supper in the evening. Those are our announcements for now. Oh, oh, and I should mention as well, aha, on the 25th, so next Sunday in the evening, the Sacconis will be here. I think we've sent out some material on that up to this point, right? But the Sacconis, missionaries who are over in Africa, they will be here, and they're going to give us a little bit of a presentation in the evening about the work that they've been doing. It's a little bit sooner than we might have expected, but I guess when your son gets married, it gives you good reason to, to travel across the pond a little sooner than, than later. And so they were kind enough to reach out and to, to offer to come here and to fill us in on some of the things that they've been doing since they arrived in Africa a year back. So we'll have that on Sunday evening next, and we'll be able to observe the Lord's Supper as well with them. So those are our announcements. Are there any more that we could add to that or that I may have missed? Seeing none, let's move into our worship area. Will you stand with me and take your bulletin? We're going to begin our call to worship from Micah chapter 7, and it is responsive. I'll read those portions in the light print. The congregation will respond in the bold. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham. As you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. O Lord, indeed, you did swear to our fathers, our spiritual fathers, that you would not leave them to languish in their sin and in death, but instead that you would send that one of the seed of the woman to come and to bring redemption. 
Indeed, your steadfast love was manifested in Jesus Christ, in which you showed us compassion, through whom you tread on our iniquities. And you did so by treading on him. What faithfulness, what love, that you would overcome our sin and our death, and you would confirm us to your very image, restored, regenerated by your spirit, so that we might have eternal life with you as you had promised, and in a way that was unfathomable, that even the angels looked on and wondered that our God in heaven would take on human flesh incarnated in the Son of God. And Jesus would be our perfect mediator and savior. So it's no wonder that we gather here this morning to worship you, to worship you with joy in spirit and in truth through the word preached and proclaimed, through the word prayed back to you, through the visible word of the sacraments, Lord, and such faith and hope because you have overcome sin and death and you have invited us into your presence through your son so that we might worship you. What a joy and what a privilege. We are grateful, Lord. You have been and always are a good father, so much so that we can understand better what fathers should be in our life, Lord. Thank you for your steadfastness, for your faithfulness. We ask that we might have that same character about us as we call upon your name in the same line of the saints that have done so from the beginning of time and will do so throughout eternity. In Jesus' name we thank you and we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to remain standing, and we're going to take our insert rather than our hymnal to sing our first hymn, our hymn of praise in Christ alone. Thank you. Please be seated.
we've been presented this morning already with every reason to give God worship and glory because of what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. And um, that, that hymn is a beautiful reminder of that. Despite the goodness that we receive at God's hand, though, we are still all of us sinners. We're not here this morning because we are better than other people. We're here because we know we belong to God and that in Christ Jesus, we are his. And so we confess our sins to him freely. And I invite you to do that now with a time of private and silent confession of our sins. Let's do that now. Please join me in reciting the confession printed there in the bulletin. Lord Jesus Christ, you carry the lost sheep back into the fold in your arms and deign to hear the confession of the publican. Graciously remit all my guilt and sin. Lord, you hear the penitent thief. You set a heritage of mercy for your saints and have not withheld pardon from the sinner. Hear the prayers of your servant according to your mercy. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ Jesus this morning, you are forgiven of your sins, not because I declared it, but because God's word declares it. And it says so plainly in Colossians chapter 1. And it also reminds us in this passage that not only are we saved, but that salvation is not just so that we can live however we want to live. It's not so we can continue in ways of sin or disobedience, but our salvation is so that we can bring glory to God through acts of obedience. So here's that reminder this morning from Colossians chapter 1, which says this, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We're going to sing now hymn number 486. I invite you to stand with me, and we'll sing these beautiful words from Psalm 51, standing together, hymn 486. Oh, 
on my Savior heart. Teach thy wisdom to my heart. Make me pure, thy grace bestow. Wash me whiter than the snow. God, my heart renew, make my spirit right and true, ask me not away from thee, let thy spirit dwell in me, my salvation's joy impart, steadfast make my will. Please be seated. And let's pray together. Lord Jesus, only begotten Son of the Father, we praise you for your saving work on our behalf. We had no other path to God in heaven, but you have opened the way for us. And Father, we thank you for sending your Son and for together, Father and Son, sending the Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have come, that you teach and encourage us, that you convict us of sin and help us to pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for many other gifts, for the encouragement and instruction that we have in your word for the sacraments that are the physical representation of the gospel to us. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ here at Redeemer Presbyterian Church and the body of Christ wherever it gathers. We know that we need one another and we thank you for the blessing of our fellow believers. We have many other gifts for which we give you thanks. We thank you for our families for the way that they nourish and encourage us. We thank you for our fathers and those who have been like fathers to us. Uh, we thank you for godly men that you've put in our lives, whether living or now dead. We, we give you thanks for that wonderful blessing in each of our lives. And we thank you for our friends, for those that you bring close to us to teach and encourage us to pray for us and to join us in our daily walk. We thank you for our school, for the ministry that you have given us here, and I pray that you would continue to bless and sustain it. We thank you for your provision for our material needs. We thank you for the good health that we so often enjoy and take for granted. We thank you for answering prayers so many times we've stood here before you and joined our hearts together to pray for things, and you have heard and answered those prayers so faithfully. So we give you thanks that you are God that hears us and that sees us. Lord, this morning there are requests that we wish to bring before you together. 
And we ask that you would hear us in these matters. We pray for those in our number that struggle with ill health of various sorts. We pray for Joan. We pray for Laura. Lord, we continue to pray for Tony McCracken and thank you for, um, for healing her and sustaining her. Or we pray for those in our number that struggle with difficulties that we don't necessarily see, those that may be depressed or discouraged or lonely for struggles in homes and in places of employment. All of these hurts and difficulties we ask you to hear our prayer in these regards. And more than bringing us relief, we pray that you would teach us through these things as you promised, that you would teach us patience, that you would teach us reliance, that we would be sanctified by every difficulty that we face. Lord, we pray uh, for uh, our missionaries and those who carry out the work of the gospel, both in our own community and around the world. We pray for uh, the work of crisis pregnancy centers in our community. We pray for the Sacones and thank you for the opportunity we have to enjoy their fellowship and rejoice with them in, uh, in the marriage of their son. And I pray that you would uh, continue to bless the work that they do through Rafiki. Lord, we pray for persecuted believers around the world and those that live in places of great difficulty for believers in China, and North Korea, in Laos, in Cuba. Lord, we pray for believers in the Middle East who daily face threats against their life because of their confession of Jesus Christ. We pray for their protection and growth and grace, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go out in power to every corner of the earth. Lord, we pray for the affairs of nations, we pray for our own, that our land is a, would be a place where justice is done, that our government would be a terror to evildoers and a protector of the righteous and the innocent. We pray for our president, our governor, all those that represent us and enforce and make laws in our land, that they would do so righteously and in the fear of the Lord. We pray that you would bring peace around the world, that wars would cease as the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to every man, woman, and child. We pray that the conflict in Ukraine would end. We pray particularly for the Sudan as well, that where there is killing and unjust violence in these places, that it would be put to stop. As we begin a new week now, we don't know exactly what we need. We come to you as children come to their father, asking you to provide for us just exactly what we need because we know you're a good God. You're a God who hears us and cares for us and loves us. And so we commit to you ourselves, our work, our families, everything that we are and everything that we hope to be. Praying in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to now take up our offering as an act of worship, and I'm going to ask Dave if he would please come forward and collect the offering. Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost, Amen.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these gifts that are returned to you out of your bounty. We thank you for the way that you so generously provide for our needs, and we pray that you would continue to do so. For those in our midst or in our congregation that are in need, oh, we pray for generous hearts ready to meet those needs. For these gifts in particular, we pray that you would use them for the furtherance of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And you'll see before you there in our bulletin our catechism question for today. It's question 25. I'll ask it, and I invite you to respond with the answer. How is Christ a priest? And we are going to be looking at that concept in the sermon this morning of Jesus Christ as our priest. So it's a fitting question for us to have today. We're going to have a, a corporate prayer for illumination. It's, it's adapted from Psalm 119, printed there for you. We're going to pray this as we prepare to hear God's word and ask that he uh, would open it to us by his spirit. So please join me in this prayer. Blessed Lord. Teach me your statutes, so that I may faithfully declare your holy ways. May your testimonies be more valuable to me than any wealth this world provides. By your Holy Spirit, give me deep delight as I meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. May your word not be forgotten, but remembered and obeyed by us and all your people. Amen. I invite you now to turn with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 9, and to stand now as we read God's word together. I think, um, I think subconsciously I must have channeled Justin here, because I put Hebrews 9, 24 through 28 in the bulletin, but I'm really going to start reading at verse 15, so, um, so you'll be standing longer than you thought. These words from Hebrews 9, listen closely. This is God's holy and infallible word, and it says this. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called many receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Please be seated. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. As we examine it this morning, uh, we pray that you would 
Help us to see it clearly. Help me to speak it clearly so that our Lord Jesus Christ, the great and final high priest, might be honored and glorified by what's said here and in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think we're all familiar with signs. I mean, it's a good thing probably that Michael's not here because there's some deep philosophical things here about signs and what they symbolize. And we were actually discussing it not that long ago um, from Augustine. But I think we all get the basic idea. Signs communicate something important. Um, and sometimes those signs are so familiar to us that we know what they mean without any words being involved. Think about a corporate logo or a road sign. Um, none of us would mistake that sign for the thing itself. The golden arches, for example, are not themselves McDonald's. The falling stick man that's warning you the floor is wet is not actually a falling person. And what we see in Hebrews is that we can apply that principle to something a bit more complex. Um, let me give you another example outside of scripture. Take the flag of Maryland, for example. It may appear like a confusing rectangle of red and white and black and yellow, but it has a symbolic meaning. On one level, you can look at that flag outside and it's a piece of colored fabric. But at another level, it represents a place it represents a people. It represents even a government. And so it, ha so it is that before us today, we have a passage reminding us that the Old Testament, that the tabernacle in the Old Testament and the priests are a sign, a copy, which represents a heavenly reality. And as we've been working through Exodus in the morning and examining the tabernacle in some detail, we've been looking at a sign something that signifies or points to something else. Hebrews 9 reminds us what the tabernacle symbolized. It reminds us of the beautiful truth of Jesus, our perfect high priest, and of heaven, which is God's eternal dwelling place. Before I talk about the passage in any more detail, there are two critical things I think we need to understand as Christians that this passage helps illustrate to us. The first one is this, namely, that heaven is real. And secondly, that we need a priest. We very often live as if what we see, taste, hear, and touch is all that matters. We make decisions based on what can be bought, sold, or used. Sometimes we're even tempted to do this in church. We can prioritize comfort, entertainment, and in all that, we miss the reality of that which we cannot see and that which has been purchased on our behalf by God himself. While the tabernacle and eventually the Jewish temple were beautiful structures, they were only signs pointing us to that which is most true, God himself. The true holy place is heavenly, the true sacrifice is final, and the true priest is Jesus. So that's the first thing, that heaven is real, and that we are often distracted from that heavenly reality by all these things around us. There's a beautiful illustration of this from C.S. Lewis in his, um, in his novelette, The Great Divorce. Anybody read that? A few of you have. I, I, I recommend it with some caution, because <laughs> there are some issues there, but one of the things that I think he says most beautifully is this idea of the reality of heaven. Um, if you're not familiar with the book, in it characters come from a dirty, grimy city and they, they ascend into heaven. Um, they ascend into a shining heavenly paradise, and a few of them are delighted by what they see, but most of them are overwhelmed by it and actually prefer something less. Um, and it's a, good, it's a good illustration of how we sometimes live. 
Um, we are more delighted by what we see here than enchanted by the truth of heaven and Jesus Christ there as our high priest. Well, our passage in Hebrews this morning makes a similar point, namely that heavenly things are the truest things. The second thing is that you and I need a priest. We live in a demystified world. We're firmly grounded, as a matter of fact, in the priesthood of all believers as Protestants. True enough. But this passage reminds us that although we can go to God and confess our sins and bring our petitions to him directly, this privilege was bought for us by a sacrifice. The God who's depicted in the wilderness of Sinai, a God of awesome power, destructive plagues, a God whose voice was nearly unbearable for mere mortals is still God. And yet he invites us to call him Father, to pray to him in the middle of the night when we can't sleep. This access to God came at a price, and it continues to come to us through the intercession of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. So with these two things in mind, let's look this morning at how Jesus is the heavenly high priest, the true and final priest. How are these things true of our Savior? Well, the first is that Jesus represents us perfectly and finally. Any human representative is flawed. Look at Congress, for example. Um, but Jesus never fails to represent our true interests before his Father. He does that perfectly. Jesus will always be heard as he intercedes for us within the perfect love and unity of the Trinity. Listen to what Jesus says about his relationship with God the Father in the Gospel of John. This is from John 17, very familiar words. Jesus says this, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Whilst I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them is lost. You see, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, and when the Levitical priests went into the Holy of Holies to represent God's people, they came as outsiders. They came as people themselves, needing to be sprinkled with blood. Remember a few weeks back uh, to Justin's sermon that Moses and the leaders of Israel could not stand God's direct presence. <laughs> They're at his footstool, at, his, at, the, at the lowest point. Moses himself cannot bear that presence of God. He must be shielded from it. But Jesus, Jesus calls God Father. And he invites us to call God Father, too. And Jesus says that he and the Father are one in the mysterious unity of the Godhead. Jesus promises that no one given to him by the Father will be lost. Moses and the priests could make no such promise. The priests of the Old Testament made sacrifices on behalf of people, at least some of which were surely lost. But Jesus promises you and me that we are not lost and cannot be. And that's such a precious guarantee for us because Jesus knows exactly what we need and he will not fail. His intercession with the Father is perfect on our behalf. Second, Jesus is a better high priest, is the perfect and final high priest because he's dealt with sin completely. There are very few things in life that are truly final and complete. 
Um, yesterday, many of us were outside toiling away in the garden, right? Um, we were pulling weeds and trimming or painting the fence. And none of us are fooled into thinking we did those jobs permanently. Um, I think we all know that before, before long, the vines will begin crawling up the side of the house. The weeds will pop out of the mulch. Even, they might even get around the fabric that we put down to keep them out, because that, that happens too. Um, there was actually a tree over here growing between the foundation and, and the pavement. There was no dirt. I don't know how it was there, and it was uh, popping up. That is, that's the way of the world. Things don't end up being done completely and finally. But Jesus deals with sin that way. Jesus deals with it once and for all. For hundreds of years, sacrifices were made every day. Death and fire for centuries. And yet Jesus ended that system and replaced it perfectly. We occasionally need to remind ourselves that Jesus and the grace that he bestows to us are not merely inoculations against sin. This meal before us this morning is not a booster shot or an infusion of grace that wears off. This is not Jesus weeding our spiritual garden, you know, and we will wait for more weeds to reappear. No, it's much more than that. Jesus dealt with sin once and for all on the cross. He broke its power. He claimed the name that is above every name. He tore the curtain in half. He entered God the Father's presence without trembling, as the priests of the Old Testament did, but he does it with confidence and with joy. And what is the testimony of this? What's the proof? It's his resurrection and ascension and his gift of God the Holy Spirit who comes not just from God the Son and not just from God the Father, but from both together as a testimony that reconciliation and sacrifice are complete. In Jesus Christ, these things that we confess when we, when we stand up and repeat the creeds, these are not just dry recitations. These are words of comfort to you when you feel overpowered by sin or you feel condemned. They are the testimony to us and to the whole world that Jesus has entered the heavenly place in triumph. And he invites us to enter with him by faith. In fact, these things are simply the most important things that anyone can know. So Jesus is the, first, is the final high priest because he knows exactly what we need in the, unity of, in the unity of the Godhead. He deals with sin completely and finally. And then he also is returning. We're reminded of that here at the end of our passage this morning in Hebrews 9. Jesus is the true priest because he's returning. Jesus has not just made the sacrifice, saved us from the penalty of sin, and been our inter intercessor. He is also returning to save us complete, completely. So easy for us to think of salvation as something that happens once when we exercise faith and are saved. But while our justification is a one-time declaration by God of our righteous standing in his sight, the process through which we are saved is ongoing and has its culmination in the return of Jesus. Every Old Testament priest died and was replaced. None of them returned from the dead. But Jesus will finally demonstrate the completeness of our salvation and the e efficacy of his sacrifice by a glorious return. This return is something we earnestly pray for in part because it will be the final vindication of Jesus as our priest. It is further proof for all the world to see that Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable and final. Jesus is coming again, but not because he forgot to do something, but because he is patiently waiting for all those who are his to be brought into his fold. So with these truths about Jesus as the high priest in mind, how should we conduct ourselves as those who are covered by the sacrifice of Jesus and await his return? Well, the first thing I would say this morning is that we must understand that we are made for heaven. Um, 
I'm, I'm breaking some unwritten rule here by quoting uh, or referring to C.S. Lewis twice in one sermon. It's a sign, it's a sign of some weakness, and uh, I can talk to you about that later. But, um, but as I was reading this passage, it reminded me of, of, a, of a quote my, my wife often shares um, from C.S. Lewis where he wrote this, If I find myself with desires which nothing in the world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Once a month, we recite the words of the Sursum Corda. And one of the things that we ask for in that prayer is that we would not be distracted by earthly things, but that we would, with the eyes of our hearts, see the spiritual reality of Jesus crucified for us. Thus, it should always be. We look at life and family, the beauty of creation, and often we see only the thing or the person in front of us, rather than the spiritual heavenly reality. I was thinking about this in, as it relates to Father's Day. Where do you learn the meaning of being a father? You learn it from, from God as, as our father. When you, if you are blessed to be a father, when you act towards your child as a father, you are acting out something much more important than merely putting shelter over your kids or feeding them or paying, paying the bills, you are, you are enacting the most important and mysterious things in the universe because you are taking a role, um, a heavenly role. And that happens in all relationships of our life. It happens if you do something as simple as plant a seed, right? Think about all the illustrations in the Bible where it reveals a heavenly meaning behind ordinary things you do, like cleaning the house, weeding the garden, fishing, exercising. All of those things um, have a heavenly meaning. And as we do something like recite the Sursum Corda together, which we'll do uh, later in the month, these aren't just empty words. It's rather a reminder to us that we should ultimately see and crave and feed, those, feed on those things that are heavenly. Secondly, not only are we made for heaven, but we must recognize our own inability to cover our sin. I remember when uh, Pooh and I were first married, we lived in a third floor walk-up in Lower Bucks County. And the apartment was what realtors would describe as cozy. Um, it, was, it was carpeted with, with some thick, beige carpeting throughout and um and we were burning a candle in, a, in our apartment it was a, it was a it was a black candle of course and i accidentally knocked that candle over and it had after it had been burning for a couple of hours and was really full of wax and um i hurled black molten wax all over that apartment um you didn't know it could go so far and right into that thick beige carpet well, for several hours, um, I was running around trying to get those tiny splatters of black wax out of this plush carpet um, without success. Now, I did learn the secret, and I can tell you later. I did eventually figure it out. But mostly it was me frantically running around trying to get rid of all this black wax. That's how we behave sometimes. We rush around trying to find ways to justify ourselves and to cover our sins with excuses or with good deeds. But these things will never satisfy God's perfect justice. If they could, then why would Jesus have died? Why would Jesus have ascended and entered this heavenly place on our behalf? Why would that be necessary if we could somehow cover our sin ourselves? Only Jesus can cover our sin, and he's done it. So I invite you this morning to rest in him. Confess your sins as we've already done and know that Jesus has already made a way for someone like you and me to enter the Holy of Holies. And thirdly, this morning, we can face the future with peace. Our world is in turmoil. And there are many things that can cause us anxiety, both personally and on the world stage. But by God's infinite grace, we are already ushered into the presence of God. 
While we do not yet see Christ standing on the earth in triumph, we know that day is coming. While we can believe this, it may be harder to see yourself. And know that if you're in Jesus Christ this morning, you are seated in heaven with him. To know that, even in your personal struggles, your future is secure. The mess and frustration of your life can feel overwhelming at times. But at those times, it's more important than ever that we seek the peace of knowing the ultimate sacrifice has been made and accepted. That as surely as he came, died, and rose again from the dead, that Jesus will come again. I've never asked him this, but I suspect that Ephesians 2 is one of Stephen's favorite passages because I think all of us have heard him recite it at one point or another um, with with great passion. I probably should have memorized it myself, but I I don't have it down to the level Stephen does. But I, I thought I'd read it to you and think about what we've just heard about Jesus opening the way into heaven for us. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes this, And you who are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom, all, uh, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see what this passage expresses so beautifully is that in Jesus Christ, you and I are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. While the Israelites that we've been reading about in Exodus Exodus stood outside in the outer court of a physical building. Christ has come with the heavenly reality, and he has flung the doors to heaven open wide for us. And may God give us the eyes of faith to see that, to know that truth, and to see our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we're in awe this morning of your great goodness to us in Jesus. We pray that you would help us to turn away from the vain and empty things of the world, to see the heavenly reality that's on display before us. Even as we take the supper together, do not allow us to be confused or fascinated by these earthly things, but instead realize the heavenly truth that they point us towards the truth that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, that he's risen from the dead, that he has ascended into the heavenly places, and he waits there for us, making intercession on our behalf. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Justin's going to come now and lead us in the administration of the Lord's Supper. Will you stand with me as I read our words of institution? It's going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please be seated. Well, friends, we've just been blessed to receive 
a word about the intercession of Jesus Christ. And as we look at the table that is put before us, it speaks of his mediation, of his intercession. How could it not speak that way? When we take these small, meager items and feed upon them spiritually, then we understand there is no access into the heavenly places. There is no access into that holy of holies without the Lord upon whom we feed spiritually in those heavenly places. That was a good word. We're grateful to Glenn and the Spirit, of course, that spoke through him to remind us as we come to the visible word, it is not so that we might be bogged down by these things, but instead it is we might be lifted up to that place where Jesus sits even now. Well, let's go ahead and uh, go to the Lord in prayer, but I will remind you that in order to be lifted up to those places, we must make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ commands that part of that profession is obedience and participation in his church. So we must have made that confession within that church to partake of this supper so that we might do so honorably and worthily. That is why Paul gives those instructions later on in the same passage. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. If this characterizes you, we'll ask that you let the elements pass you by and be further reflective and convicted about the purpose and point of this. It is not ultimately to exclude, but it is so that we might include, that more might be added to the role of Jesus Christ to make this profession. But for those who don't, we don't partake as we eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are grateful that we have this opportunity to come to the table as we have been reminded from your word in Hebrews. You are a great high priest who has made this supper available, whereas before it was eaten only by the priests of the line of Aaron. So now, this priesthood of believers, we are able to partake of it because our high priest has offered up his own self as the sacrifice and as the meal. Not so that we might feed so meagerly and so ordinarily and mundanely upon earthly elements, but instead so that we might feed spiritually. And by doing so, our faith might be encouraged, our character and image of you more refined, our hope and anticipation of that return of Jesus more strengthened. May you indeed do all of the things that you promise through this sign and this seal, pointing to Jesus, the mediator of the benefits of the covenant of grace, and affirming, authorizing, that as he administers them to us in his spirit, they will affect, they will make true all of these things that you have promised. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. I've already read on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he says, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that as we partake of of your body, Lord, we know that this bread in no way becomes your flesh physically, Because you sit seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Your body is in one place as the incarnated Son, even as your deity is everywhere, Lord. But your humanity is in one place. And that, too, speaks of your mediation. That, too, speaks of your willingness to be one of us. So much so that you would let this one body, which is yours for all eternity, you would allow it to be broken under the very wrath of God for our sins. As we eat of this bread, may we remember. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.
The body of Christ, eat of it, all of you. In the same manner, Jesus also took the cup, and when he had given his thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's the cup of the new covenant. His blood, which is shed for many for the remission of their sins. Amazing that Christ would describe that horrible act that was about to happen on the cross on our behalf. He would describe it as a cup of blessing for us, when for him it was only a cup of wrath, a cup of judgment. But he was that perfect offering, and the only priest who could offer it up for us. Let's give thanks and be mindful that this cup has turned to blessing and joy for us, so that even as we eat and we remember somberly that it is our sin for which Christ died, we can also winsomely partake of it knowing that it was to a purposeful end, an end of resurrection and life with Him through all eternity. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that this cup that we drink of, small and brief though it might be, it signs and seals those eternal, large benefits that you have bestowed upon us as our true mediator and savior. May we eat and drink both with a solemn remembrance that it was because of our sin that you were upon that cross. Nonetheless, we can also eat and drink winsomely knowing that you chose to do it on our behalf. It was not something that you were compelled to do. But instead, out of your free grace and mercy, you made that decision because you loved us. Because our Father loved us. And as children, now we can drink of this cup in blessing in the house of the Lord. A house that will remain and stand forever because you have become its chief, chief cornerstone. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. We continue to use here at Redeemer both wine and juice. The wine is arranged on the outside and the juice is in the middle. Two rows? So the, first, the outer two rows are where the, juice is, or the wine is and the juice is right in the middle. in the new covenant. Drink of it, all of you. Let's give thanks together. Oh Lord, we do give you thanks. It is not of our own doing or our own invitation that we have come to this table, but we have been beckoned here by Christ. He made this an ordinance for his church to be observed throughout the time in which he tarries, not inactive,
but instead working toward the glorification of his Father and the establishment of his kingdom forevermore. And as we eat and drink, we further establish that kingdom as you give us the privilege to be participants in its growth and in its permanence. You indeed were offered once to bear the sins of many, but you will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for you. So Lord, as we close, we acknowledge that we do eagerly await for you, even as we eat and drink of this meal and we feel satisfied spiritually. Still, the wondrous blessing is that we want more. We will not be content with just this, but we need our Savior in our presence for all eternity. And we know that you will be faithful and just to make good to your promise and to return so that we might have that. Ever kindle that hope within us, Lord. May we ever be heaven and forward-looking, eschatological, ready for that realization of the fullness of the blessings that this meal points to. In Jesus' name, our great high priest and mediator, we pray. Amen. Well, as we close, we're going to stand to sing our hymn of thanksgiving, taking up our Trinity hymnal, turning to number 308, sing, Jesus Paid It All. benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, friends, just by way of reminder, we'll have a nice time of refreshment now, which precedes our Sunday school, which will move over, if that's okay with you, Chris, you know, not to put you on the spot, as I tend to do up here, right? Um, we'll move over to the, uh, to the gardens to enjoy Sunday school. And then again, this evening, we'll have our third Sunday fellowship at the church. Please do plan to bring some type of meal or goodie to, to share so that we can partake together.